Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. We are into the second quarter of the year, uh, which launched at the very beginning of this week, Monday, and and we're going to try to do a couple things this week. I want to recap what's going on in the here and now this week. Uh, it's been a pretty big week up for markets so far. Um, we're recording here in the middle of the day on Thursday, so we have a little bit of time left in the week. But uh, all things seem to be moving forward nicely in risk assets, and particularly in the U.S. equity market. Let's start with the first quarter, though. Um, as we've been talking about each and every week, you really have had almost no downside negativity uh, since the year began, going back to the day after Christmas of last year. Uh, there were a couple weeks in March that ended up being negative on the week. That broke was at one point a 10 or 11 week winning streak. But all things together for let's call it a 13 week quarter, um, you know, the S&P 500 up about 13.5%. You had the Dow up 11.8, very close to 12%. And uh, it did so with, I think it was 11 out of 13 weeks being positive. So a very high, consistent penetration of forward movement in risk assets. Small cap equities in the first quarter were up 14.5%. Um, and emerging markets were up just a tad shy of 10%. So you had some of the riskier risk assets driving forward as well. And and when you look inside the S&P 500, the leading sectors on the quarter were technology, um, industrials, and real estate. Uh, you could argue that you had some of the China-sensitive stuff that led the way there, and then also interest rate-sensitive. Um, but then uh, the leading, excuse me, the lagging sectors, which were still up six, seven, eight percent on an absolute basis, but were the worst performing sectors within the S and P five hundred, were healthcare and then financials. So uh, financials probably be an idea, uh, an example of a sector that might, all things being equal, benefit from rising rates, and these more rate sensitive sectors like uh, real estate and industrials benefit from from uh, dropping rates, and that's what happened in the first quarter as bond yields have collapsed. Uh, so the speaking of the bond market, you have this drop in interest rates, particularly in the longer end of the curve, that push bond prices higher. So duration-sensitive bonds that act like bonds, which is our theme, treasury bonds and things of that nature that don't have credit risk, were up uh, 33 to 3.1% on the quarter. Big number up. Very few would have really anticipated that in Q1. But then you look into the credit sensitive sides and high yield was up well over 7%. And so uh, if that's not an indication that credit markets are feeling the blessing of the Fed, that they will be curtailing their quantitative tightening, that they are now in a pause mode on interest rates and it's all systems go in corporate credit. Uh, I don't know what is. So you, you have uh, an environment that it's really difficult to find negativity in as it pertains to risk assets. Now, I will argue that further out, there are plenty of unknowns that represent a risk in terms of this economic expansion. And, and that capital expenditure theme in corporate America, we uh, at DividendCafe.com this week, I, I put out a couple of charts showing how well that movement higher in capital goods orders and durable goods in manufacturing, spending, things of that nature were going, and then how they have reversed over the last couple of quarters. And I do believe that that, is very, that kind of pause and that reversal is very likely transitory, um, but should it prove not to be, or should it end up not mattering, that once the trade war stuff is worked out, the business sentiment has just been kind of more intrinsically damaged, I think that would represent a threat to this economic expansion. In in a shorter term sense, and again, more transitory type events, oil prices destabilizing could be a problem. They've really moved meaningfully higher in the first quarter and seem to have stabilized here in the 60s, which represents a good sweet spot of not too high, not too low. Um, not too low that it jeopardizes uh, capital expenditure projects and not too high that it cuts into consumer spending. 
Uh, so that reverse it could represent a problem. We know that Brexit it could very well, the way in which it plays out could generate some noise. I don't see any outcome of Brexit becoming a sort of secular headwind, but I think it does represent a potentially temporal uh, volatility inducing one. Um, and then, of course, the trade war issue itself. And I make the argument this week in Divin Cafe that at this point, it's become so consensus, the view that we've been sharing for a few months, that that some positive outcome of the trade war is most likely baked in. And that therefore, when the actual news finally does come, markets are likely to kind of come back a little just based on the fact that it's priced in already. And anything that is not uh, that reads just a little questionably in the final trade uh, announcement, assuming that that comes, could could cause markets to kind of unwind a, a little bit. I'm now uh, of the because of being such a contrarian at heart. I'm now of the mindset that it's possible that the market is underpricing some of the substantive elements of the uh, of the trade deal. And of course, we have to wait and see what final trade deal gets done, but. As I've talked about a few times already, I'll repeat, we, we uh, believe that the trade deal is priced, that the market is priced in the trade deal, not accelerating further tariffs. We don't think the market is priced in a repeal of legacy tariffs, some sort of backward you know, movement away from older tariffs that were on the books. I think that could be very positive. But I also think you have to expect that there's some general stabilization factor. That comes in as a matter as a, a byproduct of uh, there being a trade deal. The expectation that things would not worsen, that we kind of have some stability there. China now having the the uh, policy tool of manipulating their currency, uh, which apparently has already been agreed to in the trade in the trade deal that's coming, um, I think produces more stabilization in the global economy. So there's a number of these types of things, certainly the level of agricultural and energy products from the U.S. that uh, China ends up committing to buying uh, would be on a, on a subset level of the, in those sectors, in those industries, potentially very positive as well. So there's a lot to think about there in the, in the trade deal, and we continue to wait for the final result. So China's on our mind a lot lately, but not so much the the trade deal itself, which we're just kind of waiting to get the finality of, but the, um, you know, 8% nominal GDP growth, which of course the United States and many other countries would kill for, but it, it, it's really, the economic growth has decelerated to a point where these deflationary fears are real. And I don't think they have the reflationary policy tools available to them that they've pulled out of their bag the last couple of times because they had such an overheated property market and an overheated industrial uh, sector, I think they're kind of stuck in that regard. Uh, so it'd be difficult for them to stimulate their way out of these deflationary forces. And we have to see how the rest of the global economy reacts to that with China. So um, look, U.S. recession watch is continuing to get pushed out further and further. Uh, anything can change at any time, but we continue to believe that it's pretty clear ahead for U.S. economy for the remainder of 2019 and very likely well into 2020, if not through the entirety of the year. So um, you have, right now, this is the environment you're investing in. The Fed is undoing the tightening they've been doing and not raising rates higher. There's all this conversation around a rate cut somewhere this year. Um, there is an earnings environment that are at record levels, and we're trying to see exactly where they're going to come in in first quarter. And and there is GDP growth. It's the highest it's been in some time. It is up against a global economy that many of its pockets are doing poorly, China and Europe most uh, notably. And yet that seems to be an attraction of capital in the United States. So we think it's a pretty positive macro environment. Things have gotten pricier. They're not as cheap. So it requires investors to be a little pickier and to stay balanced, stay moderate. Um, but we think overall that this move higher in markets has been justified. Is there another 3,000 points to come in the Dow this year? I would be very surprised. But I certainly uh, believe that where we stand right now is economically justifiable. And and so I'm going to leave it there for the video this week. I, I am going to be talking an awful lot in the weeks ahead about dividend growth investing um, and how that fits in 
to uh, an investment policy, regardless of what the very immediate macroeconomic context may be, how it is intended to be a winning investment strategy, regardless of, of where things are in an economic cycle. And I'm going to use history and, and fundamentals to prove that. Uh, of course, this topic is near and dear to my heart always, but particularly so next week as my book on the subject is coming out on on Tuesday of uh, next week. And so we we have a big theme. We're going to do a series of podcasts or our Advice and Insights podcast about this very subject. We'll tell you more about it in the video next week. Read DividendCafe.com if you get a chance. At least flip through it to look at some of the charts. And reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, we hope you're enjoying what you're viewing here on our uh, Divin Cafe video. Thanks, as always, for watching.